Good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Amir Ziv, the Vice Dean of the School, and it's a great pleasure and delight to open the NAND and JITKAMKA Distinguished Speaker Forum at Columbia Business School, generously endowed by uh, the bo our Board of Overseers member uh, Ned Kamka and his wife JIT. This is a semi-annual event that we are running here, bringing leaders in industry, commerce, finance, and government from India and from around the globe to speak to the Columbia Business School community on topics that are pertinent to the Indian business and economy. But before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I'll use the fact that you are a captive audience and uh, waiting for the speaker to tell you a little bit about the things that we are doing at Columbia that are uh, related to uh, India. And uh, I'll start with uh, the fact uh, that with the support of the John Templeton Foundation, we founded the program on India economic policies in 2009. This program concentrates on free trade, democracy, and entrepreneurship in development, and will, promo will promote the creation of knowledge on India's economy. It is done under the auspices of uh, the Jer Jerome Chazan Institute of International Business at Columbia Business School and with direction pro from Professor uh, Arvind Panagraya and Jagwish Bhagwati. And the program will support uh, robust research on policy relevant uh, issues to India and for me even more important on its dissemination of the research through conference seminars and working papers. Colombia actually not only inhales India, but also exhales, and is uh, actually is a lot in India. And I'll move between the two uh, often here as I speak. So uh, Columbia University, which is uh, our uh, great institution, has a global center initiative as part of its, our effort as a university to expand our global engagement and network. And actually, recently, two months ago, the university officially launched its uh, Columbia Center in South Asia, which is located in Mumbai, and I'm sure it will create a lot of uh, activities over there. We also bring a lot of people here, and the South Asian Business Association, SABA, hosted its uh, sixth annual uh, conference this year, and the theme this year was India, the decade ahead, and we had as keynote speakers uh, Mira Shankar, India's ambassador to the US, Frank Wisner, former US ambassador to India, and CEOs and professors uh, all around. But the one thing of all the activities that is closest to, my pers to me personally and to me is uh, the uh, activities that we do with our students in India. And we have a lot of uh, study tours. Students are going to India to visit for a week. It's an academic thing visiting company, learning about the culture, and getting some connection. And actually, we raised it one notch in the last few years by uh, introducing immersion seminars. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, the leader of our immersion seminars in uh, India, Rajiv Holi, is here. And he's teaching a class on global immersion program opportunities in infrastructure in India. And that's a great opportunity for students, not only to learn about India, but also to do something and come with ideas. And this is a well-respected course. It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker uh, for this evening, Mr. Girish Pan Panjape, who is the joint uh, CEO of Vipro IT Business uh, since 2008. Mr. Panarjape joined Vipro in 1990 and has held a broad range of leadership positions in critical portfolio across the corporation. Between 2000 and 2008, he was the president of Vipro Technologies Financial Solution Division and a member of it, the company's uh, Corporate Executive Council. Under Girish leadership, Finance solution grew at about 45% per annum on a compounded base over the last five years. Uh, he's established valuable customer relationship and significantly deepened domain expertise. And the share of revenue of the company from uh, financial services grew up from 12% to 25% of the revenues of uh, the company. 
In his current role, Girish is, carries the overall responsibility for the strategy and operation of Vipro IT business, and that includes the uh, financial solution, communication, media, technology, vertical enabling, and is also directly responsible for uh, driving consulting and manages the function of global delivery, CTO, CIO, office, and operation. Girish not only works for the company, but he is doing a lot for the country. He has represented Vipro and the IT industry in various uh, public forums, including the Prime Minister Task Force on Information Technology and at NASCOM. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Girish Panajape, uh, this year uh, speaker for the NAND and JIT uh, Kamka Distinguished Speaker. Good evening. Can you hear me at the back? Sure. So, uh, Mary, first of all, thanks for your kind words. Um, it is uh, my great privilege and honor to be here to address the faculty, the alumni, students, and guests uh, in the honor of Nand and Jeet Kemka Distinguished Speaker Forum. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, Columbia Business School is among the oldest and the most renowned globally, uh, not only for the education that you provide here, but also the students that you uh, educate here who then go around the world and make a great name for your university. Uh, many of the students I have come across uh, in various uh, forums where I meet with them, either as clients or uh, as uh, candidates who will seek to join Wipro and always been impressed by the education you provide. So thank you for doing a terrific job of uh, bringing up students here. I think one of the things that uh, has always impressed me is, uh, is the global outlook of the people that I've come across from Colombia. And so I thought I'll, I'll start by talking about uh, how globalization is, is changing uh, many of the actions that uh, you know our our clients and our employees are taking. So, <clears throat> and one of the things that we have uh, realized is that um, uh, you know uh, while globalization has been around for at least uh, two or three decades, I think in the last ten years uh, many things have become very distinctive about it. Uh, I, I in my uh, view. Uh, you know, the world has gone through a couple of phases. There was this phase from 2000, roughly two, to 2007, where, uh, you know, thanks to uh, easy financial, uh, easy money and ease of finance, it seemed like uh, every year was going to be better than the previous one, and all growth and prosperity was completely linear. Uh, and, um, you know, it kind of created a certain view about life. And last two years has, has demolished uh, that kind of sense of optimism. Uh, I think when I talk to people today, they are much more uh, thoughtful about how they think the world is going to shape. And I think apart from the financial meltdown, some of the other things which have uh, got people thinking are uh, things like, uh, you know, this whole thing about resource shortage and global warming, uh, you know, whether you know, oil prices have gone to $100 and come back down again. There is talk about shortage of key mineral resources like copper and steel. Um, there is this uh, always concern about the threat of terrorism. What happened in the Times Square, or could have happened in Times Square one week ago, um, brings, makes everybody realize that while certain wars may have been won, there is no permanent victory against this sort of phenomenon. Uh, then there is uh, this whole uh, problem about um, changing demographics, especially in certain countries of the world, whether it's Europe or it's Japan, where there is question on whether they could count on you know, economic growth to continue the way it has happened in the last 30 or 40 years. And the immediate concern about uh, while uh, you know, unemployment figures have been good in the last two months in the United States, 
given the uncertainty in the economic environment, whether it is a crisis in Greece or something else happening in Iceland, uh, how certain can we be about uh, the economic growth and continued high employment? So all of this is uh, affecting uh, not only ordinary citizens like us, but also the decision making in, in, in corporate boardrooms. So from an era, if I kind of contrast it of huge optimism and, and feeling that every year will be better, to an era now of some certain amount of uncertainty, and certainly a view that uh, there is bound to be some amount of turbulence and volatility in, in the world over the next five to 10 years. So given this fact uh, that is, everybody feel, feels that there is, there'll be progress, but there'll be a lot of ups and downs, and the world will not go in a straight line, but there'll be a lot of zigzags, some of, some of it them driven by economics and some by other factors. Uh, how would they cope in, in a world like that? And I think one thing is becoming fairly clear to everybody that if they're going to live in a world like that, uh, then uh, they have to plan on being uh, nimble and agile, and uh, they have to be thoughtful in where they make the investments and how far a commitment do they make. So which is bring uh, customers to ask themselves on whether <coughs> they're doing enough for transformation or not. Uh, because in a volatile world, unless they reinvent themselves periodically and they transform their operations every now and then, they'll cease to be relevant or will be suddenly caught with either too many resources, too many people, too many factories, and which will make them unviable. So the theme of my speech today is uh, how, how do companies compete and how does transformation help them to compete? So one of the biggest things we have seen in the, in the last uh, two years is how much focus uh, of clients and especially large American multinationals has changed from the well-known, well-established markets in the West, whether it is Europe or it's in U United States, to the emerging markets in Asia and in other BRIC countries. And, uh, it is true that even now those markets are relatively small and no CEO will stand up and say that 20, 30 percent of the revenues will come from the emerging markets. But they do know that uh, if they look at the GDP growth in some of those markets which range from somewhere between 5 and 8 percent and they look for the GDP growth in their current established market which will range from maybe 0 to 3 percent. The way of the future is that they have to go and address those markets if they want to continue to grow. One of the different things about trying to sell in those markets is that the products which are originally designed for the developing countries are rarely suitable for, for the emerging countries. Uh, there is a well-catalogued example of uh, G, which entered uh, China in 1990s with their uh, products, especially in the healthcare industry, which were designed for the US market. So a typical uh, ultrasound machine uh, would cost hundred thousand dollars, and they did make progress over the last over the last ten years, and they were able to tap into all the big hospitals and all the sophisticated uh, doctors, and they did make progress, but it didn't really move the meter on G's global healthcare practice. It's only in two thousand two when the local Chinese team actually designed a product which was not at hundred thousand dollars, but at fifteen thousand dollars which provided almost 70 to 80 percent of the functionality of what the G ultrasound did. Did this one five, fifteen thousand dollars. And uh, did the sales really take off? And this product really was based on a simple laptop, a pro and some smart software, which delivered almost 70 percent of the functionality which a high-end ultrasound did. And that changed what product was getting delivered and what market segment was getting addressed. And we are seeing more and more clients actually thinking like that, saying that if they have to address the emerging market, then they have to basically develop a new generation of products which serve the needs of that market and are not basically stripped down versions of products designed for the developed world. We are in the process of developing a product for a large telecom uh, equipment maker. And the problem is very straightforward. If you look at a country like India, 
uh, 20 years ago, the telecom penetration was such that they had 3.6 million people who had a phone. 3.6 million people out of 100 billion, uh, a billion people. Today, the number is crossed 500 million people who have a phone connection. And the interesting thing is that the next 100 million will come from people in the rural areas whose paying power is even less than what it is for the first 500 million. And even the first 500 million, the average revenue per user is sub $10 against the $40 which is there in, in a developed country. So if you want to address the next 100 million mobile users who have paying capacity of maybe 4 or $5 per month, how do you design a product that is A, at that price point? Number two is rugged enough to withstand uh, the heat, the dust, the power fluctuations which are there in the rural India, right? Uh, and is easy to maintain. There is a fourth practical problem. In most urban centers in India, you it's worthwhile for telecom or telecom operators to put up towers on which they can mount base stations, which basically transmit telephone signals. In rural areas, it's not worthwhile to put up those. Uh, dedicated tel telecom towers. Instead, these will have to be mounted on poles and some existing buildings. So the challenge that has been posed to us is how can you design a base station which instead of weighing 60 kgs as it does, will actually weigh maybe more like 20 kgs because it has to be uh, you know, supported on poles and buildings and not on dedicated towers. How will you design a base station which will cost $1,200 against the regular seven to $8,000? How will you design a base station that has fewer moving parts because the cost of maintenance has to be low because the logistics of doing maintenance is, is not uh, affordable? And we have a target of designing, building, and making this product ready in 18 months. If we succeed, this product will probably go in all of African countries, will probably go to parts of China and emerging markets. And we are, if we are successful, it will revolutionize access to basic telecommunications at one-fifth the price of what is actually affordable. So the summary is that unless multinationals rethink their value proposition, the product specifications and their addressable market, they'll never be able to reach a portion of the market that genuinely can afford and wants those services. So every company has to basically rethink and transform their value proposition to address a different market segment and, and a different uh, yeah, customer. The second thing uh, that is uh, required in this environment is for uh, organizations to think hard about what is core to them and what is non-core to them. We are doing work with a university in in Australia, and this may be interesting for all of you folks from Colombia here. Um, this university has about 11,000 students, 1,700 people in the faculty. And while they do a great job on education, they think that they ought to be investing a lot more in two things. They ought to be investing a lot more in basic research, which they are not been doing enough of. And they need to usually upgrade uh, the facilities that they provide for academicians in terms of technology and research capabilities that are required. However, they don't have the resources because Australia is a very competitive market and they just simply can't raise fees or look for grants to get them to that level. So what they're doing instead is actually outsourcing to us uh, all of their admissions, all of their technology, and hoping to generate resources so that they can redirect those resources in what matters to them most, which is they want to invest in education, which basically invest in research, and they want to invest in improving facilities for their uh, faculty. And they have a proposition in Australia saying that if the university in, pulls out a certain sum of money, that amount of money will be matched by the government. So, one X US uh, Australian dollars they save actually gets them two X Australian dollars to invest. So customers are radically rethinking what is core and what is non-core. So things like admission, every university think is, is what they do. Students actually look forward to that, but that's a part that they are actually outsourcing. 
So that's the second thing that what is core and non-core and what do you want to preserve and what do you really not uh, care that much about. The third thing is about agility and speed. Uh, and here again, uh, while there are markets which have been underserved for years and years, but the competition is really moving fast. So if if organizations cannot quickly move to serve that market, then they'll find that somebody is already there or that their value proposition has already been uh, offered by somebody else. There is a uh, European uh, company which is uh, I think number 9 or 10 worldwide in, in wireless telecommunication. Uh, they came to India a year ago, or 18 months ago actually. And when they came in, they were the sixth operator. Typically in any industry, if you are beyond the three, you, are, you are almost have a losing proposition. And in this case, the number one provider was already 100 million subscribers. Uh, the number two was 70 million subscribers. So they were coming in almost 10 years after the telecommunication industry had opened up. And they had paid close to half a billion dollars for license, for just getting license to operate in India. So they were under enormous pressure to do something different. Otherwise, people are wondering why they were, you know, wasting money to get into market as a sixth player when incumbents were so strong and where the commercial was so challenging where the average revenue per user is sub $10. So, <clears throat> and they had no operation in India at all. So completely greenfield. Uh, but since they were keen to expand, they had to come completely think out of the box. They put a target saying that they have to go live in nine months time from the time they got a license to the time they went live had to happen in nine months time. Typically it takes two and a half to three years for operators to go live after they've got the license. Here given the fact that they were so late to the market, they had to do it in nine months time. They had to set up an organization ground up. They had no organization there. And they had to try out a completely new channel because the, all the traditional channels were already taken. So the first five or six guys had already captured all the traditional channels. <clears throat> we help them set up a completely new channel based on retail distribution. Because Wipro also is, is a FMCG major, we basically got them to bypass the traditional telecom channel and use grocers and retailers as a channel to go into the market. We help them set up the whole organization and do the launch from virtual clean start to first subscriber activation in nine months time. So if companies think out of the box and think of speed and agility and don't worry about how they did it in their home markets, it can make a big difference. I had, uh, after we did the launch, I had a chance to meet with their CEO and, and their chief architect. And he said that even in their home country, they had not tried something like this after being in business for 50 years. Uh, so, if you want to go after a completely new market, then you have to come think out of the box. And I think that's, that's where the opportunity is. The fourth thing which uh, has to be kind of thought of is uh, uh, a different cost proposition. And everybody thinks that cost proposition is really based on low wages. And it's only partially true. Because if it is only based on low wages, it will evaporate over a period of time. Because everywhere wage inflation, especially in the emerging market, runs 10 to 15 percent. And if you, uh, you know, are in a highly competitive industry, you get poached. So the, any value proposition based just on low wages doesn't sustain. We, we saw it firsthand. Uh, because we, we are a big system integrator in India. So we manufacture computers, we sell computers, we distribute you know, products from Sun, Cisco, Microsoft, and so on. And we had a very nice business, which was not only doing system integration, but basically supporting all those equipment after they were sold in the field. And you know, typical uh, annual maintenance contract used to be 15 to 20% of the product value. And it was a nice, uh, profitable business. When the price was started, Basically, that business evaporated. What was 15, 20% annual maintenance contract fell down to 1 or 2%. And the price of all the uh, computer equipment basically collapsed by 30 or 
but we were still locked into this idea that we had to maintain uh, computer equipment for our clients by having lots of people at their premises. So if I, we were doing for Columbia University, you would have half a dozen engineers located in your premises, you know, looking after the computer systems and making sure that they were working well. But given the fact that the annual maintenance contract prices had crashed from almost 15% to 2%, and the price of computers themselves had slashed by 30 to 40%, this model was simply unaffordable. So what we did instead is that uh, we moved uh, completely to a remote maintenance model. Thanks to the rise of internet and remote connectivity, we are able to tap into almost 80% of the computers that we were maintaining for our clients. And we moved that to a centralized location into a relatively low cost center. And today we run 80% of uh, the computers that we manage remotely through this center. Apart from the fact that it is uh, remote, we also invested significantly in tools and technologies and good processes. So that last three years, even though our business has grown almost 30%, we have barely added 5% in terms of headcount. So through automation, through best, better usage of tools, we are able to service the same clients more efficiently at much lower price points and still keep a business going. So when I say cost, you can rarely make a business run purely on wage arbitrage. Unless you put a huge chunk of technology and process behind that, it is simply not sustainable. So that's a transformation that almost every business has to think of when, when it wants to adapt. Finally, uh, if you think of uh, any services business, a big component that of that is how do you, how do you manage the, the people supply chain? because people are a big part of, of any business that you do. And in any services business, the cost of people is somewhere between 50 to 55% of, of your revenue. And in some times it is not the cost, but just sheer availability that makes a difference. So Wipro, for example, has grown from 100 million to $5 billion. And in, this, uh, in the last 10 years, and we have gone from having less than 10,000 people to 100,000 people now. So apart from the fact that we have to pay more, it's just the sheer availability of people that makes a difference between whether we can grow the next 20, 30% or not. And while we were doing this growth, many of our peers were also growing at roughly the same rate. And a lot of American multinationals and European multinationals were also into India trying to do the same thing. So suddenly there was a huge influx of companies which were trying to go after the same talent pool, uh, which we were going after. So apart from the fact that wages were going up, it was the sheer availability that, that was becoming a big constraint. So what we did was two initiatives. Uh, one initiative was to look at a non-traditional source of talent. So while everybody went after engineering schools and you know tried to get more and more people from there, uh, we said while we'll continue to do that, we created a different channel where we set up a program to hire science grads, those who didn't get into engineering. And we tied up with a top engineering school to create an earn and learn program. So the science grad would come into Wipro, uh, would work during weekdays, but would be taught by Bits Pilani, which is a top engineering school in India, on weekend and after office hours. And they would earn an MS degree in engineering from Bits Pilani at the end of those four years. It created a completely different channel through which we generated talent. And what is even more heartening is that today this team of people is the best team of people that we have in the organization. They are the most loyal, they are the most knowledgeable, and uh, they, are, they are the most highly contributing people. And they have kind of got this feeling that uh, they want to outdo the engineers because uh, they didn't get into the engineering college in the first way, but they want to show that they can be better than them. Uh, so this created a different kind of pool of people that we could tap into. The second thing that we did, which is little uh, non-traditional, is that we realized that the real problem why uh, we couldn't get enough engineers was that uh, because of a sudden surge of demand, 
there is just not enough faculty that existed uh, who could teach engineers. And uh, while you know private engineering colleges have gone out and hired some people, they were just not effective. So we have been running a program called 10X, which is to train 1,000 faculty members uh, on uh, the basics of teaching. And these are bright engineering guys, but have never been teachers in their life. So we bring them into uh, either our campus or our outreach programs and teach them uh, the method of communication, how do you conduct classes, how do you make sure that uh, you know, students learn at the end of that classes. And we run uh, a convention every year where we bring these people back into Wipro to say what have they learned. And some of the stories that they tell about how much it has changed their lives and how much students have gained from that program are, are uh, phenomenal. We know that this will increase the pool of talent that is available and not all of those students we will be able to hire or those students may not want to join Wipro. But a small, a relatively small effort from our side is increasing the entire talent pool that is available to the industry as a whole. And that's another way to you know, in, ensure that you have enough high quality supply of talent that is available to be able to meet the demands of the industry. So that's again a little out of the box thinking on how to handle uh, resource constraint, uh, which is beyond the traditional thing of going and you know poaching on the same talent pool or paying a little bit more. Uh, so in summary, you know uh, I will stop here because I'm sure that you know there's some questions that will come up. Uh, but in summary, I think in in the volatile world that we are going to face. Uh, Adaptability and transformation is a constant theme that is going to be relevant for all uh, management students and managers and CEOs. And I can only say that uh, you know the comment that was made by Charles Darwin that it is not the strongest of the species that survive, not the most intelligent. It is the one that is most adaptable to change that's going to survive. I think that holds true for all of us. Thank you. We will open the forum for questions, but before you ask a question, we need the mic because we need to preserve this knowledge for other generations. So uh, <laughs> start over there and uh, Katerina will bring the mic. Thanks a lot, that was great. Uh, so I've had great experiences with Wipro outsourcing. We also tried market entry uh, way back about 10 years ago, selling to the government. Uh, we sold successfully to Swisscom, Deutsche Telekom, Singtel, uh, but corruption came up in India. How can we make corruption history in India? <laughs> you know, that's a tough ask. Um, but all I can say is that uh, uh, things are changing. So we ourselves kind of uh, were not uh, big uh, providers to the government because of some of the reasons that you mentioned. But I think there is increasing transparency. And uh, we ourselves are realizing that uh, not serving the government is not a great way to, uh, to be a part of that ecosystem. So we have gone back, and even if it takes longer to uh, kind of win deals, even if it sometimes takes much longer to collect the money after having delivered the project, it's something that you cannot really stay away from. And uh, there are parts of the government which are fairly clean, transparent, and where you can do business. Thanks very much. Um, I want to talk about your business uh, and the industry that you're in. Uh, Wipro, I guess, you and your uh, competitors in India, you've done a phenomenal job of growing organically. But talking about transformation, there are a number of uh, US players that are making these transformational changes um, and wanted to get your views as to you know, what you think you need to do and your competitors in India to look outside in terms of keeping up with the, with the transformation that the Western players are going through. Okay. Um, actually, the big transformation Western players have done is to come to India. 
So, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm not joking. Actually, today in India, the, one of the biggest employers are people like IBM and Accenture who hire you know, as many people as we do. Uh, so in some ways, they have uh, you know, emulated our model of global delivery. But uh, the reality is that they have a, traditionally a very strong connect in the boardrooms in, in Europe and United States uh, because of their you know, uh, history where they started out as consultants and they started as system integrators and they have people with 30 years of history with an organization whereas we are relatively young and may have a few years of history with the organization. So what we, are, uh, what we and many of our peers are trying to do is to kind of replicate that uh, by, uh, so if I kind of step back for a moment, I think most clients, whether in Europe or US or elsewhere, recognize that uh, companies like Wipro has, have terrific ability to execute uh, because of the process, because of technology knowledge, we have an outstanding ability to execute. Sometimes it is a business context that is relatively new to us. So we are building out that capability uh, in the respective markets by going out and hiring uh, you know, business experts, uh, consultants, so that clients see us full service providers and not people who only do part of the value chain. And in the last, uh, I would say, two years, we made progress by hiring consultants and business experts so that today, well, in many cases, we are seen to be on par with some of the big players. And really speaking, the competitive field has really narrowed to about eight or ten companies globally. Uh, at least three or four of them are from India, and the rest are the traditional SIs who have been in, in, in Europe and U.S. for a long time. So I would say that's the consultative ability and ability to have board level relationships are the gaps that we are working to close, whereas our competitors are moving the, in the other direction. Rob Kuduru, and thank you for the perspective. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned is uh, your initiative in expanding the talent pool. Mm -hmm. um, what I hear from business executives in India and elsewhere is that they spend all that money and time to train people and they just, you know, just leave and go to, to their competitors. Uh, I wondered how, how wide is that problem? And the second thing, second part of the question is, do you actually track the productivity of your employees year to year? Sure. So uh, two parts of the question. Um, <clears throat> you are right uh, that uh, there is a perception among uh, many business executives that they spend a lot of time and energy and money training people and then people up and leave. Um, and so the investment that they've built, uh, invest, uh, the investment that they've made in building that knowledge and expertise kind of vanishes. Um, you have to accept that, uh, you know, the average age of uh, people in the IT industry is somewhere between 26 and 28. So at that age, you can't hold uh, youngsters to stick to one company for, for very long. They're not even sure whether they're in the right industry, the right company, the right uh, program, or whatever else they're doing. So they are in the exploratory phase. They're trying to figure out what to do in life. Whether they want to live in India, whether they want to live in the US, whether they want to live in you know Australia or wherever it is. So they are in a phase where they want to kind of find out about the world. And uh, so it is not easy to kind of hold them to a particular area in which, in which they've started. So we have uh, uh, deliberately invested a lot in capturing that knowledge institutionally and building up a you know, way to make it not the knowledge of that individual, but it's to make it an institutional knowledge. And that is the only way you can, you can handle it. Uh, because if you just try to hold on to people and it's been done through bonuses and golden handcuffs, uh, it works for a little while, but you can't really rely on that. So trying to uh, move the knowledge from being purely personal to make it institutional is the only way you can say uh, we have created value in the organization. Uh, the second question that, uh, that you asked was uh, productivity. Or productivity. So that's something that uh, we've taken a lot of pride in tracking right from the beginning. So we have uh, you know, created systems for tracking productivity of individuals by various streams, uh, even technology streams, and how much is the output uh, per individual and how we have been able to grow it year after year. 
the best, <laughs> I would say, um, uh, I would say yeah, the best way to measure that is the kind of commitments we give to our clients, where we guarantee that uh, the productivity that we deliver back to them will go by X percentage year after year. Uh, so we have to up our game every year if we have to live up to the commitments that we made to clients. And uh, it, it is a, a little bit of a cultural issue because it means a amount of overhead for people to capture their efforts to, so that we can be able to measure that productivity. And uh, we find that in some other uh, countries where this has not been the norm, people actually resent having to capture that data about what work people did and what was the productivity out of that. But we have just got it in our system so that everybody does it as a matter of course. Thank you. And it isn't as simple as Walmart pricing. In, uh, in I was uh, what you said just triggered in my mind. You know how Walmart works. Every year the price goes down by a certain percent. So, uh, which is easy to measure because it's just a price and they have the baseline. Whereas it's much more difficult because the varying technological. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Thank you so much for coming in to speak. Um, a couple of questions. One, are you able to expand more about which university you've been helping with in Australia? And has it been more in front end enrollment, or was it more the back end IT? And the second question is, I love your perspective on Europe. And whether you see that picking up soon? Is it more of a traditional the next few months, maybe over a year, or just general thoughts on that would be great. Thank you. Sure. So uh, I won't be able to name the uh, university in, in Canada for you know, client confidentiality reasons, but uh, what we are doing is the front office of admissions as well as all the finance and administration of, of the university. So it is kind of the, uh, in some ways, the um, fairly core part of, of the university. And of course the IT, but IT is more like a support system to them. So it's admissions at finance and, and the IT. Um, on, on Europe, uh, <clears throat> clearly after what happened in Greece, everybody is a little nervous. Uh, but uh, the reality is that uh, there are uh, European multinationals who have to compete every day with American multinationals and Asian multinationals. And they cannot uh, stay away from what drives competitiveness in the global market. So while they do struggle with local labor laws and all the restrictions that the European community imposes on them, they still have to find a way out. And I think the good news for us over the last two or three years has been that all of them have found some way around uh, the local restrictions. So we have had stronger growth actually in Europe in the last 12 months than we have had even in the United States. It's because uh, European multinationals have kind of shared inhibitions and said, you know, if we have to survive, we have to do what makes sense for us shareholders and be competitive in the marketplace. Hello, my name is Shilpa Mohan. Thank you so much for visiting with us today. You talked about transformation and, and having a global delivery model. And I think one of the things foremost in people's mind as they're entering new markets is the risk of entry and then ma maintenance. So can you speak a little bit about your risk management strategy, how that's structured, and you know, as a global player, how you balance, balance this over time? Sure. So I must say that um, you know we have learned quite a few lessons in risk management in the last two years. Some of our biggest clients kind of went bankrupt. Um, <laughs> but I think the good news was that it didn't uh, impact our overall, uh, uh, overall business uh, standing because we didn't have, uh, no single client contributed to more than X percentage of our revenue. Uh, so even uh, though the clients themselves failed, it didn't change the, our uh, overall revenue profile. What was also interesting is that the work that we are doing for many of these clients was so critical that even in bankruptcy, uh, we were paid to continue doing that work because just to keep that organization going, they couldn't stop the work that we were doing. So while we may have lost potential growth, et cetera, on the client, we didn't completely lose the business at least for a transition period till the firm was in, in bankruptcy. Uh, and the third thing that happened is many of these guys got to get taken over by somebody else. And the work simply transitioned from you know, the original firm to the new firm which took them over. 
so we were able to kind of uh, mitigate that to a lot of things. But it did uh, teach us some lessons. So our you know CFO now tracks the financial viability and the risk of many of these clients much more closely than what we would have done in the past. Uh, and uh, but I would still say that's the, that's just the context of a volatile world. So if you are going to want to be a big player in the world in which the market is brutal and you know some of our clients failed because of financial crisis but they could have failed just because of poor competitive situation uh, so you just can't stay away from from a business or an industry because some of them may not succeed uh, it's so your overall portfolio management about how you distribute risk how much do individual clients contribute to your total portfolio and then whatever else you do in terms of taking insurance that can, that can protect you but i think it pays to be vigilant in in, in the volatile world How long do you believe um, uh, the very high margins um, enjoyed by both the large Indian IT service providers today is really sustainable, uh, given the change in the dynamics of the marketplace uh, over the last year or so, uh, fixed price contracts uh, coming under pressure, pricing in general coming under pressure, your competitors like Cognizant going after market share as opposed to trying to sustain margins, um, and, 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 and new revenue models coming to the marketplace like out, uh, outcome-based pricing from, the, from guys like iGate and, and so on and so forth. Do you really believe that you can maintain 30% plus EBITDA margins over the next few years or do you feel that it's going to sort of converge to somewhat of a lower level in the, over, over the next few years? Come forward? Thanks. No, I think margins are sustainable. And uh, uh, actually, even during the entire slowdown, where there was you know significant amount of pressure on on us from clients to kind of share the pain, um, we were able to maintain margins. In fact, over the last four quarters, we upped the margin quarter after quarter. And I think the big difference is that we have moved clients to think uh, from instead of thinking about price, think of cost to them. And the moment you move uh, the discussion away from what what price I charge to what does it cost you? You can move from you know how many people I have and how do I do effort to outcome. And when you move the discussion to outcome, we find that uh, we have many more levers that we can play with, which gives value to clients uh, without uh, you know diluting our margins. And in the space of last two years, we have moved actually fixed price contracts from 22% to 42%. And uh, Almost all those fixed price contracts had lower price to clients and better margins to us. Rajiv Kohli, SAP. Um, could you talk a little bit about the impact of IT domestically in India and where you see it happening? Sure. Um, I would say that uh, the uh, the corporate uh, uh, world in India has embraced IT pretty early. So uh, if you go to any uh, significant company, they would have got all the same systems that a, as a big company in the US or Europe would have. So they would have got the traditional ERP, they would have the CRM, they would have supply chain. So they would probably have invested in the same IT systems and have the same level of efficiency internally as, as any you know, uh, large multinationals out of India. I think where the big gap uh, is and used to be even more was in the public sector. Uh, either uh, state-owned enterprises or state government. Uh, you know, just the government, which was uh, non-automated. And I think what is heartening is in the last uh, couple of years, that has started to change. Uh, the state-owned enterprises are the first ones to kind of computerize. Uh, you know, banks are a great example, which were state-owned and had heavy unionization. I had to struggle to get the first computers in. But today, uh, I can say that 90% of the state-owned banks are more computerized than some of the even, you know, I see big banks in the United States and elsewhere. And because they use the latest uh, software products and they have kind of thought through the implications. So uh, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that 
you know, that level of automation will continue and you know, go to the next levels. I think the next uh, big uh, uh, opportunity is in the public services, how they get delivered. Uh, and I think some uh, work has started. We, uh, we have just implemented a large project for uh, the state insurance corporation, which is health insurance basically, which provides health insurance to industrial workers. And uh, from a situation where it was completely manual, uh, in the first, we have done first phase of the project, in another two years we'll do the rest, 40 million uh, beneficiaries will have a smart card, which will allow them to access public health services anywhere in the country, independent of where they have done the work or where their families are located. And this was a big, this is a big difference, because traditionally they are a migrant labor who work in one state, whereas their families may be in another state, and they were typically denied the benefits because the records could simply not come together. Today with the computerization and what we have done with the smart card, you know, the, the migrant labor's family may be in Bihar and he may be working in a cotton mill in Surat and still we'll be able to connect the two and provide them services. So I think there is hope uh, uh, that something will, will happen on that. Count. I think we have to stop now. I want to thank Girish and uh, appreciate and some token from Colombia. Thank you so and much. I would like to I would like to invite everyone to a small reception and the uh, opportunity to mingle and ask uh, each other questions and share <laughs> the knowledge uh, that you demonstrated in the question. Thank you very much. Thank you.